Don't make me count to one, two, three. Yeah, it's the parent rap, y'all. We may spend most of our time chasing toddlers down, but we still know how to rock the hizzle. I don't even know what you just said. We used to be cool. Back in the day, back on the block. Watching PG-13 movies, staying a boy after dark. Then we had a couple shorties, and now we're really flossy. Cause now we be rolling with our own little posse. In the minivan, or in our little wagon. Let me throw it to moms, cause the little one is sagging. I used to bling it up, I used to dress real shoe. Now I accessorize the food that's already been chewed. And that's all right. I make this diaper bag look good when I'm walking through the mall trying to wrangle my brood. My PB&Js will set your world on fire. I could make you mac and cheese blindfolded on a wire. I'm wiping the doo-doo, kissing the boo has got them eyes in the back of my head. I see all you do, using your full name so you know I ain't playing. And that's why all my kiddos, they keep saying. Mom, mom, she's the bomb. Rocking all night till the break of dawn. So I'll grow up strong Got my second seatbelt if we crash head on Dad, dad, he's the man Working real hard to support the clan Trading in his Porsche for an old sedan Raising those brows if we get out of hand When it comes to Candyland, I'm a stone cold player Helping out with the homework, I'm an algebra slayer Wrestle car seats into place without spilling my mug If I tuck you in at night, you'll be as snug as a bug Then I'm off in the morning to make that cheese You may not know this yet, but it doesn't grow on trees Now mama, take it please What? Uh, take it I'm dropping time off like the hot potty Training on my tots Washing all the pants and pots Tying little shoes and knots Giving knowledge to your brain Like if your friends jump off a train You don't have to do the same Not get your toys out of the rain I'm cleaning every spill Cutting coupons like a bill If you need parental skill Now you know we are for real You don't think our rhymes are ill, boy? Then you're grounded for a mill Mom, mom, she's legit Making us chill when we pitch a fit Telling us to share and never to hit If you can't say something nice, put a sock in it Dad, dad, he's the guy Never gets tired of playing I spy With a constant barrage of kids asking why And he always pretends he needs another tie You know money doesn't grow on trees Why buy the cow if the milk is free? This won't hurt you as much as it hurts me. If you want dessert, eat another veggie. Close that door, you weren't born in a stable. Sit up straight and kiss your Aunt Mabel. Close your mouth when you chew. Get your elbows off the table. Mom and Dad of the year, check it. That's the label. It's a parent rap, y'all. And it's a parent. We're great parents. Mom and Daddy in the house. Mom and Daddy own the house. Mom and Daddy need to clean the house. Keep your hands to yourself, boy. Don't make me stop this beat. I'll do it. I'll pull this beat right over. Did you people learn anything there? I like that last look at the end. <laughs> Some of you don't know how to do that. That's because you're not parents yet. It'll come to you. You're genetically predisposed toward that very defiant, bring it on sucker, I will dominate you look. By the way, speaking of which, I thought I'd get dressed for the moment this week. Just saying. So everybody's always welcome every weekend at this house except for the last three years, this week and a half in June, if you're into LeBron, y'all just get up and go find yourself another church right now. <laughs> in love, I say that, in love. And uh, no, not really. We Listen, last year down 3-1, lost the thing. So right now, boom, got our game face on. Game two tonight, it's gonna get ugly in the paint. Bring it on. <laughs> I don't know if McGee is smart enough to actually be on the court, as the Cavaliers say, but it looks like he's doing a number on Tristan Thompson. It was, game one was not pretty, so anyhow, it was awesome. Now, what are we talking about today? I don't know, I, I don't think it's the Warriors. Oh yes, raising great kids. We did the first part two weekends ago. Now listen, we can't take the time to revisit the vital foundations that we laid two weekends ago, so get online. All of our weekend teachings are archived. Just go to our teaching page on our website, okay? The secret to successful parenting 
is to treat our children just like God the Father treats us. Does that make sense? That's the foundational premise for everything that we are saying uh, about raising great kids. Now, get your chin off your chest, quit obsessing mom and dad over your past failures or that your children in the moment aren't what you dreamed they'd be, hoped they'd be, right? And let's just say this is a brand new day with no mistakes in it. You can be a great parent. God will help you. And what we're going to do is import some wisdom and understanding from the Bible that will make us far more effective uh, molding and mentoring and shaping the lives of our children than we ever thought possible. Remember, what your children will one day be, they are right now becoming. What they'll be at 20, 30, 40, 50, we are making their destiny in the moment as you and I talk together, okay? Now, why is this important? If you're a parent, why these teachings are important, this three weekend series, Raising Great Kids. So again, it was two weekends ago, this weekend and next weekend, we'll wrap. If you have children, it's so important because what's at stake? Your kid's eternity is at stake. What else is at stake? Your legacy. You know what I think? I think when you and I are 80, 90 years old, whatever that number's gonna be, when we leave the planet, right? I think we will largely define the value or the worthwhileness of our life by what our children have become, okay? That's not to say if your children are adult children and have not become what you hoped that they would become or thought they should become, it doesn't mean you're a failure, but I'm simply saying all the other stuff that distracts us from being the best version of the parents God intended for us to be, all that other stuff is just window dressing, this is the main event that decides our life, and it will be our legacy. Now, if you're here and you don't have children, uh, here's the big takeaway for you. I want you to watch the parenting principles that God the Father is teaching the parents in the house. Whether you're together with your mate, whether you're separated, divorced, whatever the circumstance may be, because how God teaches us the parent is how he's parenting you. Even if you're 40, 50, 60, 35 years old, it doesn't matter. In other words, these are transferable principles that you're going to see uh, in the heart of the father, and it will help you understand his motivation toward you and his intent toward you as an adult single individual. Now, if I could make a critical statement this weekend, here it is. You'll want to write this down. Create your home to be marriage-centered, not child-centered. I don't think that anybody in the house, you would love it if your children grew up to be self-entitled little narcissists. Would that make you happy? I don't think so. And yet that's what the energy of a child-centered home does. It teaches that child falsely that they're the epicenter of the universe. And that's not how life works. Wait till they go out to university. Wait till they get their first job. Wait till they actually have to pay their own way. They're going to find out uh, that it doesn't work that way. It doesn't mean we don't treasure, cherish, honor, invest the best part of ourselves in our children. We do. But we build a marriage-centered home not a child-centered home, because when those kids see a committed mother and father, when they see what actually true, real married love looks like, we set them up for the greatest possible aversion of their own married life and home life together when they're old enough to make that happen. Now, a word of grace. Uh, if it's correct that about 50% of American marriages are ending in divorce, that means that probably 40 to 50% of the parents in the house, you might be a single parent. I grew up in a single parent home. My mom, five of us kids, I know what that looks like and feels like at least from the kid angle, right? And so I want you to hide this promise in your heart. God is not only a father to the fatherless, he's a husband to the husbandless. In other words, God will make up the difference for you. You're not a failure. You're not a reject. God has big plans for you. Uh, this is not how you planned it, but you've lived long enough, all of us have, right, to discover that life does not always unfold like we expected it to. Life can be incredibly unfair. And so I want you to know God is with you, God is for you, and God loves you, single moms and dads 
in the house. So what we teach our children is a very strange concept that, hey, kid, I love you so much, but I want you to know I was not put on the planet to do your bidding, right? We teach that to our sons and daughters. That's not mean. That's truth. And it's also healthy. So what does the Bible say? Train a child in the way that they are to go. And when they're old, they won't turn from it. So did you get that? Train a child in the way that they are to go, mothers and fathers, dot, 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 and go there yourself once in a while. In other words, the power of example, the model before their eyes. Because children learn not what is taught, they learn what is caught from a thousand ordinary days of living together with you in the home as their kid, okay? Now, having said that, uh, I want to do a very brief review of part one. We said three things uh, were foundational in our part one review. Number one, we've got to understand our children, right? Their style, temperament, and personality. Secondly, we have to accept our children. Um, as much as it may surprise us, God chose those children for us. And then thirdly, we've got to remember that rearing our children to love God is the number one way to evangelize the world. There's a lot at stake here spiritually. Now, we have six common sense biblical principles that we're in the middle of that will rear spiritual, positive, well-adjusted children. I think that probably is the goal of everybody in the house. I hasten to add that I realize when we talk about biblical principles, while it may be biblically correct, it's very possibly not politically correct in our culture today. I understand that, I do. And I also respect that. I'm not gonna take a backhanded swipe at anybody who chooses to do it different. But I do think we all have to wrestle with this core philosophical issue. And it is philosophical and it will define all of the days of our lives on this earth. Here it is. Does truth change because we change? In other words, is truth a moving target that changes and evolves as we Americans change and evolve over the generations. That's largely what's at debate, by the way, with the United States Supreme Court. Is the Constitution a living document that evolves and change, changes with Americans as we change, or is it a fixed body of truth at a moment in time? See, I would opt for that with the Bible. In other words, the Bible is a fixed point of truth, and though American generations keep evolving and developing new sets of moralities and lifestyles and the way that we approach life as we do, it doesn't mean that truth changes. I don't mean in any way to be unkind about that, but I'm saying that's what you're going to have to decide as you parent, as you soon release your children into a culture where values and morals and ultimate life agendas are absolutely up for grabs. Our culture today is very much like the Old Testament book of Judges. The last verse says, in those days there was no king. Each man and woman did what was right in their own eyes. And that defines our culture today. So I want you to know, not to disappoint you, we're talking about biblical wisdom, biblical understanding for rearing our sons and daughters, okay? Having said that, we talked about just the first of the six common sense biblical principles for raising great kids last time, and it was this, that the goal of discipline is to help our children associate pain with wrongdoing and thus help them go to heaven eventually. Now, when we say the word discipline, please don't have a default setting in your mind where you think, oh, physical dip discipline and we're wailing away on the kid. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible is talking about. The Bible does talk about correcting the sinful inclinations of our children, but what we're referencing here, meaning myself and scripture about the goal of discipline, is a lifestyle where the home has order, purpose, discipline, where there's an agreed upon core set of values. Values. The goal of that is to help our children understand that pain comes with wrongdoing. There is right, there is wrong, there is such a thing as sin. When we do right, when we do good, we invite blessing and success upon our lives. When we do wrong, we invite very possibly great pain into our lives. We need to embed that into our children and furthermore, we don't want to intercept consequences in the lives of our children. 
We'll get into this more next weekend, but one of the worst things that we can do for our sons and daughters is break this all-important connection that we're describing here in the first principle, that if they do wrong, we intercept consequences and bail them out, which teaches them, I can do wrong and get away with it. And that's not gonna work when they're 35 on their own with their own family. What will happen is they're gonna be in San Quentin. And so we make sure that that association, that connect the dots, is very uh, deeply embedded in our child's understandings. What does discipline ultimately do? It trains character, and furthermore, it leads to a life of self-discipline. I mean, what's gonna make your kid who's now eight get up one day when he's 35 and do the right thing? Get out of bed at 4.30, uh, have devotions, love your spouse, Make breakfast for the kids. Get out of the house on time for work and school and go and work a diligent day to bring home family uh, money to resource the family and pay taxes and coach the teams and do all. What, what is going to make your sons and daughters, my sons and daughters, do that when they're adults? It's right now. We are building a framework that will destine our children for success in their adult lives. Okay? Now, uh, before we dive into number two, do I have any grandmas here in the house? Any grandmas? Okay. So this one's for you grandmas. One grandma uh, took her grandson uh, to the store with her, and the little grandson, uh, he was learning to read, and grandma needed to pick up some personal items and so forth. So they were in that part of the store, and while grandma was putting stuff in the basket, the little boy picked up a package of pantyhose and he began to read the package of pantyhose, and he read Q-U-E-E-N-S-I-Z-E. -E. And then he looked up at his grandmother and said, hey, Grandma, you're the same size as our mattress. <laughs> Don't you love kids? So you grandmas remember that. Second practical biblical principle is this, fill it in, we've gotta shape the will without breaking the spirit. Now you say, John, what is the will? You know what the will is. It's that capacity within us to make choice, to make decision, right? So we've got to shape that will because if we allow our children at 5, 7, 11, 14 to be making all the decisions in, the li in their lives because they're free moral agents and entities, I'll tell you what they're gonna do. They're gonna pick sinful stuff to do. And the Bible says that we are to shape the will of our children. And you say, well, John, why would they pick sinful stuff? Because they're your kid, and they're my kid. We're the big sinners, and they're the little sinnerlings, right? And it's the inclination of the fallen human soul to do that. Even though we're created in the image of God, we have sinned. And so we shape the will, but notice the delicate balancing act without breaking the spirit. You say, John, what do you mean by the spirit? I mean that essence, that very fragile essence in your child of their self-worth, of their God-worth, of the image of God in them. That's what we're talking about here. So that's the delicate balancing act. So listen to Dr. Bruce Naramore. He writes about labels. Whenever a child is labeled, an image is written on his or her little mind. Repeated labels influence a child who's shaping an image of him or herself. Accusations such as clumsy or stupid become important elements of the child's growing attitude toward themselves for a lifetime. By the way, I pastored a family one time who apparently their most uh, favorite term of endearment for their children was reject. Reject, get over here. Reject, go do this. Reject, you dummy, go do that. How do you think that set the child up for the rest of their life? Think about it. Dr. Nermore continu continues, however, each time parents communicate respect, love, and trust to their child, they're laying another building block in the foundation of that child's self-esteem. Praise, genuine acceptance, patience, and affirmation go a long way in helping a young child cultivate a good attitude toward him or herself. Such responses from parents and other people help to form the roots for a lifetime of the child's self-worth, unquote. Write this verse down, everybody, would you please? Write this down. Proverbs 18, 21. Proverbs 18, 21. The Bible says, 
In the tongue is the power of life or death. And I want all of us as parents and caregivers and investors in the lives of our precious little ones to ask ourselves the question, out of this hole in my face, am I speaking words of life or words of death to the little people who are under my influence? Am I speaking truth or falsehood? Am I speaking worth and value or am I speaking failure and sinfulness? What is coming out from my tongue? In the tongue is the power of life and death. Principle. Kids will almost always forget what we say, but they will never forget how we made them feel. You with me on that? Okay, let's build on that for just a moment here. We have to ask ourselves, are we imprisoning and killing our children uh, with the tape recorder, right, that we're installing in their spirit? We do install that tape recorder from their infancy inner voice with a playback button that your child will hit when they're 45 years old living 3,000 miles away from you. They'll awaken in the morning and the first thing they will do is hit that playback button over and over and over and over and over. Now where did they learn that playback button? Where did they have that tape recorder embedded in them? They did that in their infancy from our words. What are your children saying to themselves about themselves? I assure you, they are saying to themselves about themselves what we are saying to them. They are or they are not. I'm asking us today, in the tongue is the power of life and death. Are you speaking life and vision, hope and love and all the good things of life and God? Or are you predisposing them toward a very difficult going forward in this life and the six inches between their ears where they're constantly hitting a playback button of negativity, of disapproval, of you are insufficient, you are reject, you are not smart enough, you are not pretty enough, you are not good enough to be my child. When we talk about shaping the will without breaking the spirit, word of wisdom, do it when they're young um, because it's far easier to bend the sapling than it is the deeply entrenched mighty oak. Do it and begin when they're young. If you have a strong-willed child, I want to encourage you yet again and say that is a good thing, not a bad thing. Don't let your strong-willed child who has opinions whose default setting is always defiance and a thousand challenging questions and all these other things. At a neutral moment, not when you and he or she are amped up, but in a neutral moment, get them in a bear hug and whisper in their ear, listen, you are my child and you're just like me, you got opinions. And often your opinions and my opinions, they ain't the same opinions. But I love you so much and I'm committed to you, and I thank you for this great inner strength that God has given you, and it's my job to shape it, and mold it, and guide it, and mentor it. And my son, my daughter, I'm telling you this, I will win whenever we have a challenge, because I love you. I will win. That's my job as your dad, as your mother. I will win. So let's just cut through all the nasty part and go straight to the end game. I win and I'm guiding you the next step on your way to forging a character that will be passionate to beat after Christ. See? So it's a positive thing because you train that strong will, you will create a giant for God. I have to add this, because, and I'm gonna say it every weekend. When we talk about discipline, when we talk about character building and soul shaping and so, we are not in any way speaking about any kind of harshness or abuse. We're talking about a relentless, irresistible love and yes, necessary toughness at the decisive moment 
but relentless love. We're not in any way speaking about any kind of abuse. Abuse of a child in any way, shape, or form. It is illegal. Furthermore, it is immoral. Furthermore, it is sin. It is sin. No matter how you may have been raised and you are trying to undo some of the unhealthy things that happened to you, don't repeat your family unhealthy legacy. Say, listen, that may have happened. That stuff did happen. It was not nice. There are points I think it wrecked me, but this is a new day. God has made it a new day. I am new in him. All things are past. Behold, all things are new. I am going forward. I'm learning from the past, but I'm not entrenched to the past. It's a new day in Jesus. Onward and forward in my parenting pursuits. Another thing for you fathers, and some of you are looking at me, and you dads are saying, John, man, you seem to have be ganging up on dads uh, in this Raising Great Kids series. Uh, I'm just saying, and I say this with and I'm saying men, you may have been negligent or absent in the past. Don't walk out of here with shame and guilt and self-abasement. Repent and begin by doing the right thing and showing up in the lives of your children. You can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. Showing up means I love that child. Now here's what I wanna say to you dads. Give your sons and daughters your blessing. You say, John, what do you mean by blessing? I mean that unconditional approval. Do you know how many children go through life not certain at all that they are adequate in the mind of their father and mother? That they, in fact, aren't a huge disappointment to their father and mother because they have a sibling that's smarter, more gifted, more intuitive, more whatever, and you have felt like the reject much of your life. I'm saying to you fathers, get your children in their chubby little cheeks and pull their face close to you. Make sure you use breath mints, breath mints before you do this. Pull their face close to you. Look in their eyes and say, I love you. I believe in you. You are a treasure. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are my son. You are my daughter. I am going to walk by your side. I'm your father now, your mother now. One day, we are going to be best friends. And I am destining you for greatness in God. I pray that way. I believe that way. I love that way. Child, I am here for you. In the book of Genesis is the tremendous plaintive cry of one of two twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. Jacob manipulated to get the father's blessing and Esau showed up just a little bit too late and began to cry out in the book of Genesis, bless me too, father. Is there no more blessing for me? Bless me. And we have a generation of American sons and daughters crying out for their father's blessing. And I'm saying, dads, show up. Do not disappoint. Give your children your unconditional approval and blessing. There's a third principle in these six practical biblical principles. Fill it in. And it's discerned between childish irresponsibility and willful disobedience. You say, John, that's a mouthful. It is, but it's also a life-giving principle of understanding. What is childish irresponsibility? That's when the child spills their milk for the ninth time that dinner meal. So here's what mature parents do. Understanding it's childish irresponsibility, they spilled their milk because they're clumsy, because they're kids, because their hand-eye coordination is not fully developed, their little brain is not fully developed, okay? So what we do is we clean up the milk calmly, no screaming, no yelling. We pour them another glass of fresh cold milk. This time, because we're wise, we get a sippy cup lid and firmly attach it. And then we give it to them, kiss their little chubby cheek, and say, son, daughter, enjoy your meal. What is childish, or rather willful disobedience? Willful disobedience is something completely different. It is a direct no to your instruction. It's an explicit act of obedience. It's a direct challenge and defiance 
to your authority. When this happens, we as parents calmly and lovingly take the challenge, we take charge, we install discipline, and we win decisively every single time. That's how we avoid being counters in our home and yellers in our home and screamers and manipulators and having secret, secret parental powwows figuring out how collectively we two adults can outsmart an eight-year-old. <laughs> Hello? Just shoot straight with your kids. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Have a handful of core biblical values that will guide your home and stick to them. Mean them. The reason kids challenge us is they know we'll back down and wimp out. We will cave at the end of the day. Do not cave. Uh, kids will bamboozle and manipulate. Have you discovered that? Have you discovered that five two-year-olds can practically run the planet? It's true. And so what we've got to do in all of our parental wisdom, understanding, and experience, be smarter than five two-year-olds, right? When it comes to willful disobedience, that's a morals and ethic and soulish and spiritual issue. Spilling of milk, childish irresponsibility is a little nothing, I see parents that'll go thermonuclear over spilled milk and do absolutely nothing when their kid shoplifts. Do you understand what we teach our kids when we do that? When they shoplift, we intercept consequences, we bail them out, we teach them, you can do what is wrong in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the law and get away with it because I will rescue you. Bad, wrong, don't do that. Did you know the Bible teaches it's a good thing to allow our children appropriately to suffer. We'll develop this theme more next weekend, but suffering and feeling the full weight of sinful decisions informs the soul of our son and daughter. I remember learning this as a father, and as my kids rolled enough, moving into their teen years, I had a private come to Jesus meeting with each one of them and said, listen, I wanna let you know. I mean, we talked about many, many things, positive, affirming, vision, hope, you know, greatness in God and life and so. But then I said, and if my son or daughter, you ever choose to do that which is wrong in the sight of the law and of God and you end up in jail, I will not bail you out. I will visit you and I'll cry through the bars, but I will go home and leave you there to consider what you have done, to let the full consequence of what you have done come home to your soul where you say, I have sinned against the Lord. We'll talk more about that next weekend. So parenting is not easy. The only people to whom it's easy are those that have no kids. I think everybody in the house would agree probably that God our Father is the perfect parent, correct? But even he lost his first two children in rebellion, Adam and Eve. Do you remember that? Maybe you've never thought of that before. I'm simply saying sometimes we've reared our sons and daughters in really healthy homes and environments and they still make very destructive decisions. And so what we do with them now as adults is we walk by their side, we don't bail them out, we don't intercept consequences, we don't deliver them, but we love them undyingly. Without uh, any retreat, we love our children unconditionally. When Harry was a boy in Louisiana, he was always getting into trouble. And one morning while Harry was waiting for the school bus, he pushed the outhouse into the bayou. Any of y'all know what an outhouse is? Like if you go to O.co, there are those little blue honey bucket things there. And Okay, so he pushed the outhouse into the bayou, and then he got on the school bus, went off to school as if nothing had happened. His school day ended. Harry returned home again, and his father was waiting for him. And he said to him, son, did you push the outhouse into the bayou this morning on your way to school? Yes, father, said Harry, like George Washington. I cannot tell a lie. Harry's father said, all right, son, bend over. I'm going to have to discipline you. Harry tried to explain that, hey, 
father. Mr. Washington didn't spank George when he admitted chopping down the cherry tree, to which Harry's father responded, yes, son, but George's father wasn't in the tree. <laughs> Do you know I said the same thing at the nine o'clock crowd? Had a thousand people just looking at me going... It makes a pastor believe in caffeine. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> makes a pastor believe. It. Number four, let's wrap and get out of here. Rules without a relationship can lead to rebellion. You say, John, what does this mean? Here's the point. The closer your relationship to your sons and daughters during their preteen years, the easier it's gonna be to be their parent later on when it's time to bring down the hammer when it's time to set the laws, set the curfew, set the parameters of how, you know what? I was not put on the earth to do your bidding. This is not a bed and breakfast where you show up. This is a family, and we work in this family. We make a contribution. So if you wanna eat and breathe oxygen, get out of bed and get to work. See, that kind of a deal. Now, if we don't have relationship with our children, however, when that point in their life comes, they will fly the coop and rebel fully. The thing that restrains our son and daughters when they're big enough to look us straight in the eyes or we're looking up at them is the fact they have sensed and experienced all the days of their lives our unconditional love and commitment to them because they still won't like our rules and our restrictions, so to speak, on their freedom when they're of that age, but they will comply usually because they say, that man, my father, has earned the right to speak into my life because he has loved me every day of my life. That woman, my mother, has earned the right to speak into my life because she has loved me every day of my life. So rules without a relationship can often lead to rebellion and usually does. So I'm asking all of us, are you friends with your children? Um, so I'm a pastor, which means that the four children that God's blessed Carrie and I with are pastor's kids, PKs, which if you have a weird little pastor home, you're gonna have weird little preacher kids. <laughs> so I started thinking I didn't wanna turn four little preacher kid freaks loose on the planet, so what can I do here? And one of the things that I developed early on to continue to build on our loving relationship that we shared with each of our children is a statement. I said to my sons and daughters, here's the deal. I'll go to your games, you come to my sermons. I mean, think about it. What kid would like to have to go and hear their own dad preach? On, I mean, that's kind of horrible if you think about it, right? I live with the guy. Now I gotta hear him saying it. I mean, what? So, okay. However, we made a pastor's family the most joyous, wonderful life. If there was difficulty in the church periodically, never brought it home. We wanted our kids simply to have a healthy, guilt-free, clean, whole conscience toward God and toward his church. I'll go to your games, you come to my sermons. What can you say to your children that would be that same principle tied into your vocation? In other words, we've got to show up for our kids at the important moments in their lives. You say, well, how would I know what they are? Ask them, they will tell you. Ask it them, they will tell you. There's no substitute for time, and there's this debate, quantity time or quality time? Answer, both, both, quality time and quantity time. You gotta show up, because where the fruit of that relational investment will show up is when they begin to get a mind of their own and begin to challenge the core values that have been central to your family. I said to each of our four children, you, when you're an adult, you will preach the gospel. And it freaks them out. They're saying, I gotta be a preacher. No, no, no. You don't have to be a preacher. That's God's decision, not mine. I don't care if any of you are quote unquote a pastor. I do care immensely that you love God and preach the gospel and share his love with those that need to do it, then that you become a servant to mankind. I care deeply about that. You may be a plumber, you may be a mailman, you may run NASA, you may be the president, cool. But you will preach the gospel. 
And so that value liberated my children from some pretty weighty expectation. What I'm saying is think and pray and reflect hard about how you can set your children free and not create this weird little hot house of guilt and condemnation and judgment and just, it really ties our kids up in knots. Build clean, free relationships. Fathers, I'm gonna speak to you again. Fathers, I'm urging you to model repentance and humility. When my children uh, were growing up, one of the things I had to do, and I'm just being really honest with you, this is not rehearsed, or it, I had to do is call family meetings. If you're not calling family meetings, you're missing one of the big cool things of being a family, right? Um, and by the way, if you do call family meetings and your kids hate them, I can tell you why they hate them. I don't even need to be in your family. Because all you ever do in these family meetings is yell at each other and condemn each other. Make them fun things, but then also make them this kind of thing. Whenever I would blow it as a dad, and I would do that toward their mom or toward any one of the four of them, I'd call a family meeting because the Holy Spirit's convicting me, and I'm just feeling like, oh, man, what a bum. Okay, I got to get this right. So I'd call a family meeting, short, five minutes, six, seven minutes, and I would say to them, hey, I, I needed to talk to you as your dad and as the head of home here. I blew it yesterday when I spoke, and I'd name whoever the son or daughter is. I'm not going to say their name now, because they may be watching on live stream. But I'd say whoever the son or daughter is. When I spoke with you yesterday, I was unkind, and I was impatient. I was mean, and I was wrong. Could you please forgive me? Okay? And um, the children would always forgive me, and they're like, Dad, you don't need to say it. And I'd say, Stop. Yes, dad does need to say that. What I did was wrong, and I could see in your eyes, my child, I wounded you, I hurt you. I could see the hurt in your eyes when I said that thing or did that thing, and I gotta make that right. Um, kids are very honest. Often, I got a couple sassy ones among the four. You figure out who they are. Um, they would say, but dad, we just had one of these family meetings yesterday that you called to apologize for another dumb thing you did. And I'm like, yeah, that's right, kid, shut up. We had one yesterday, we're having one today. I like my odds of needing to have one tomorrow because I'm trying to be a good man here and I'm in a bad streak lately. I ain't doing good. So don't keep reminding me of that, okay? This is hard enough as it is. What that teaches your children, among many things, and I would do the same toward Carrie, where else are children supposed to see? Because when you husbands and wives are raising the, the amperage and, and the volume, right, and the decibels of your private bedroom conversations and the kids are hearing it all, the only way to diffuse that is to have a very honest, and don't make this phony, don't make it manipulated. The husband and wife need to be aligned. But fathers, you take the lead in humility and repentance and say, I have sinned against your mother. Honey, please forgive me. This thing that I did, boom. Because it will teach your children what healthy marriages look like. Because every marriage has fights. Uh, if you have, are in a marriage that doesn't have fights, chances are somebody's always winning and somebody's losing. There's a dominant and there's a submissive, right? But in healthy relationships, we've got to learn to show healthy resolution with repentance, forgiveness, and restoration to our sons and daughters. Let's wrap it, look at it with me if you would please. How can I love my children? Three words, affection, affirmation, meaning the tongue, we talked about that. Attention, meaning time, we talked about that. But I wanna focus on affection for just a minute. Fathers, to you again, do your children and do your teenage children and adult children know what the feel of a man's beard is on their face? Kiss your children when they're little on their pudgy little cheeks. And then when they're teenagers, kiss them. When their friends are standing around, I don't care. <laughs> the kids are behind them, you know, their friends are going, ah, look at this, snapping pictures. I'd say, kids, you keep this up, I'm gonna come kiss you on the cheek. Oh no, Mr. Greg, no, I'm not, okay, just kiss your kid. 
My kids would get out of school, and they know it was much wiser to reach over in the car and let me kiss them on the cheek and bless them before they went to school, because if they didn't, I stopped the car right in the big roundabout where there's 8,000 students. Hey, kid, Greg, kid, I love you. What are Greg's? Come over here so I can give you some love for the, you know, that kind of a deal. So my adult kids come home now from Boston. They don't even mess around because they know they're going to lose. They just come up, and they look at me, and they stick their cheek out. First thing they do, let's get this over with, because I know it's going to happen. It's going to be ugly or dang it. Let's just get this done. Affection. Do you hold your sons and daughters? Do you hold your sons and daughters and rock with them and whisper in their ear, I believe in you. I'm so proud you're mine. I love you. You are a treasure to me. I thank God for you. But dad, I'm a bum. Dad, I'm a loser. Dad, not to me, you're not. I declare that you are of tremendous value, worth. You're a winner. You are a treasure. You are a diamond in the sight of the father and of this father. And I love you, my child. Now, sick him, go out there and live this day in such a way that it's worth the price that you paid for it. A day of your life. Does that make sense? Fathers, kiss your children, my daughters had very tender skin, evidently, because whenever I'd kiss them with a beard, hadn't shaved for a few days, their faces would always rash up, and their friends would go, why is your face always rashed up when your dad drops you off? To well, he kissed me on the cheek when he said goodbye to me, and that's just what we do in my weird little family, okay? <laughs> I close with this. Isn't it strange how princes and kings and clowns who caper in sawdust rings and common people like you and me are the builders of eternity? We are all given a bag of tools, an amorphous mass and a set of rules upon which to build before time has flown. A stumbling block or a stepping stone. And everybody said, let's stand for closing prayer, would you please? Please.